All right, so let's start with Chromagus. Chromagus is, I think, one of the, the, the like most cool, exciting looking new cards. Uh, it is, you know, clearly a very powerful late game card in the right set of circumstances. I think that the the, the card that currently exists that's um, the easiest to compare Chromagus to is uh, Kel'Thuzad. Not only because they have similar, they're similar like body for the the cost. You know, it's a six eight minion, but they both provide like incremental increasing value as the game goes on uh, if they remain in play. The difference with Kel'Thuzad and Chromagus is that with Kel'Thuzad you construct a board that you then use your tools to attack into your opponent, uh, your opponent's guys to immediately get value and sort of lock them out of being able to interact with your stuff until they can actually kill Kel'Thuzad. Whereas with Chromagus, just the longer the longer Chromagus survives, the, the, the you know more value that you create by uh, you know doubling each of your draw steps. Uh, I think that, that a deck, if a deck's looking to abuse Chromagus, what they're going to want is cards that allow you to draw cards immediately. So you're not just waiting to draw your cards uh, on your turn. You know, like cards like uh, like Loot Hoarder, you know, is obviously a card that's pretty powerful with Chromagus because you play Chromagus, attack your Loot Hoarder, and draw an extra card. I don't know that that's, you know, I doubt that, that a Chromagus Loot Hoarder deck is necessarily going to be, you know, exactly how you want to, to, to build it. Um, or you know you look at you look at Paladin. We're gonna see a couple of cards. The uh, the new Paladin cards that actually work quite well with Chromagus. Um, there's the, the Dragon Consort that reduces the cost of the next dragon you play, and then also the uh, the what's it called? I don't know. The basically the, the card draw spell that can get discounted if you if uh, minions have died this turn, and that sort of thing. It's like okay, well, can you create a board that you you know you play your Dragon Consort to discount your Chromagus? You attack some guys in. You play the Chromagus. You you play the uh, the discount card draw card. And suddenly, you know, you've drawn four cards immediately and gotten a ton of value off of Chromagus right away. You know, Chromagus with Powered Shield, for instance, is very powerful because you can generate a draw immediately. So I think that the decks that are going to want to use Chromagus are going to get the, the best use out of it are going to be decks that can utilize its card draw effect right away and not have to just wait a turn for it. Um, otherwise, it's like, okay, well, you know, how is Chromagus better than, say, Ysera? You know, I, th I think that when you're looking at sort of late game minions, I think the... Uh, I think the, the sort of bar currently is Ysera. How much better is this card than Ysera at winning a long attrition game? The fact that Chromagus is a 6-8 as opposed to a 4-12, you know, it does mean that, that it is better able to actually fight for the board. It comes down to turn early than Ysera. You, you can play it and use a, a hero power or, or play a two-cost spell in the same turn. Those are all pretty big deals. So I think that this is a card that definitely has a lot of potential and uh, is certainly one that, that I will be looking at possibly including in a lot of decks uh, when I'm initially building with Blackrock Mountain. All right, Demon Wrath. This is a pretty cool card too. Uh, Demon, we, we've seen this same sort of effect with Fel Cannon already, and everyone needs to spam Fel Cannon faces in the chat. Um, but uh, the the ability to have one sided, or at least uh, selective damage that that you can you know you can develop a board and have effects that are able to clear out your opponent's board, uh, and you know still maintain your. It's very powerful, uh, and the. You know the the demon lock decks that we've seen so far are already actually quite strong. A lot of them do include a lot of non demon minions, so some of those will die to demon wrath regardless. Uh, but uh, some of those are things like Nerubian Egg, where you're actually totally happy to demon wrath that away. Like if you're playing against say a hunter deck, and you know your turn two is uh, is Nerubian Egg, and they like you know, spew a bunch of stuff into the board, and then you just demon wrath and you kill a bunch of their minions and trigger your Nerubian Egg. That's a really really powerful uh, effect. And I think that Demon Wrath is is a card that we're gonna we're gonna see a, a reasonable amount of, uh, you know, see more sort of demon uh, demon theme decks, demon tribal decks, you know, come out of this because this is this is a really really you know really powerful effect. Um, the ability to kill you know for instance uh, like Muster for Battle, you know, having to Hellfire away your own board in order to deal with a, a Paladin casting Muster for Battle is really you know really not very effective when you're trying to actually develop. One of the, we've basically seen Warlock decks build as you know, sort of control style decks because you know, you, you need uh, either either like just all out aggressive decks like Zoo or control style decks like Demon Lock and Hand Lock because so many of the tools that they have um, are either symmetrical like Hellfire or you know expensive to build to and this is a cheap asymmetrical effect. You can use this to wipe out your opponent's board uh, while maintaining your own or you know triggering your your death rattle and stuff like I said. So I think that this is I don't think this is the sort of card that's going to replace Hellfire. I think this is a card that creates decks that are different than those that want to include Hellfire. Uh, and frankly, the cards that are the most exciting to me are the cards that don't necessarily just slot into existing decks. They're cards that can allow for new decks to be created, and I think this is one of them.
with Dragon Consort. So this, this card is great. This is one of the most exciting cards to me in the entire, like, that has been revealed so far. Um, I mentioned when I was doing my review of uh, Dragon's Breath um, that the fact that we had seen both Flame Waker and Dragon's Breath out of Mage. Uh, so, you know, we knew there were two class cards, and we saw both of them being cards that had nothing to do with dragons. And I was a little disappointed because I, I was hoping that we would see uh, class-specific dragon-related cards. Not necessarily class-specific dragons, but cards that were class-specific that were related to dragons. So, you know, we have s sort of similar kind of thing that we've seen with mechs, which is that each deck, each class wants to build you know, a dragon deck in a different way, you know, because they're trying to lean on particular synergies that are specific to their class. Um, and, you know, while we actually didn't see it in most of the classes, we do see it here in Paladin, and I think this is probably the most, you know, exciting and powerful dragon-related effect that we've seen so far. Cost reduction effects are, you know, typically just, from a, you know, from a systemic perspective, one of the most powerful and dangerous things in any kind of uh, any kind of trading card game. If you look at cost reduction effects historically, you know whether in Hearthstone or in Magic or any other game, you know they are among the the most powerful sorts of effects that that can exist. And this is this is a particularly powerful kind of of uh, cost reduction effect because it enables you to play extremely powerful late game minions much earlier than you otherwise would. You know, unlike something like uh, Unstable Portal, which you know does give you a discount on a, on a minion, this is something you can plan for and build around. So you know you can play Dragon Concert turn five, and then on turn six you can play an eight cost dragon. You can play Chromagus on turn six. You know, and, and like I was saying before, with the the Chromagus sort of combo potential, you know, if you have like if you you have a bunch of minions for muster for battle, or just a bunch of minions kind of hanging out, um, you know, you can play, uh, you know, uh, like. The, the Chromagus and then combo into it with, with other stuff because you were able to play it early, or you can you can play it, you know, on say turn eight, but still have two mana left over to do something with with uh, with that effect. You, know, you can play any of the, the nine mana dragons like Ysera or uh, uh, Alexstrasza or whatever on turn seven. Those are all huge, huge effects. Um, and even if you're not playing like a huge minion early, you're still getting a significant uh, discount in the ability to play another thing and spend more mana on the same turn. And that's just absolutely huge. So, you know, the body here is a 5-5 five, five for 5. That's, you know, that's a totally reasonable body. It's not, you know, not, not incredible, but, you know, we've, we've seen Lotheb be a, a card that has seen play, you know, across all different kinds of decks uh, at a 5-5 five, five for 5. It's a totally, you know, totally fine body. It can test Sludge Belcher, you know, uh, trades with uh, Ancient of Lore and things like that. It's a super, you know, this is a super, super powerful effect on a totally reasonable body, and it's not even a legendary. So, you, if you're building a Paladin deck, a Paladin Dragon deck, you can plan for the fact that a reasonable amount of the time you will actually have uh, the ability to play a Dragon discounted at sort of the middle turns of the game, because you can realistically anticipate that you'll be able to draw a Dragon Consort a certain percentage of the time by that point. So uh, this is this is one of the most powerful cards, I think, in the entire set, uh, and one of the cards that I'm certainly most excited to build around. Now this is not a super exciting card to me. <laughs> um, you know, this is either a 5-2 or a 2-5. And while, the, while these are both beasts, we were told that these were like a, a flame, what is it, flame cat and flame hawk or something. I, I, I'm not really, neither of these is a particularly good deal. Uh, you know, I'm not interested in getting a slightly better uh, magma rager, and I'm not all that interested in getting a, you know, slightly discounted, you know, 2-5 or whatever. Neither of these is really has the stats that I think are, are something that I'm particularly excited about. Um, having the having the, the modularity, having the flexibility of the choose one effect, particularly given that it's a druid choose one, so it can't be silenced. It's different than other sort of, uh, you know, okay, well this guy, you know, buffing a guy. The fact that the druid uh, effect is a transformation uh, means that, you know, it's a little bit different. It, it does help enable the druid of the fang deck, uh, because it is a beast, and, and it's a, you know, relatively cheap, potentially stable uh, druid beast. A 2-5, you know, is, is not really going to be easily killed by a lot of opponents as a 3 cost, and will likely be able to curve you into your Druid of the Fang. But Druid of the Fang just isn't really a card that I think is particularly exciting to build around in a world where everyone is playing Big Game Hunter. So, uh, yeah, I think that this is, in a world where Big Game Hunter didn't exist, I could be excited about this card. But because Big Game Hunter exists, and I really only see this as being exciting as a possible enabler for Druid of the Fang, I'm just not really, not really particularly excited about Druid of the Flame. All right, Emperor Tharsian. So this is one of the scariest cards in the new set to me. Um, one of the things that, that I've actually been recently uh, thinking about and been planning on writing about um, is 
The difficulty in interacting with a lot of the sort of things that a lot of decks can do. Um, for instance, one of the most one of the most powerful and popular decks right now is uh, the Oil Rogue decks, which are largely based around late game combinations of spells, and that's it. You know, they're they're a combination of your spells and your hero powers, and incidentally having anything in play or drawing your you know South Sea deck hand to charge and just blow your opponent up, um, and. The inability to actually interact with spells outside of delaying them via Lothab, um, or just killing your opponent, those are basically the ways you can interact with spells currently in Hearthstone. Is that the, you, you, know, you can either kill your opponent, or you can Lothab them. There's just nothing else. There's no way to stop your opponent from playing a spell other than like counter spell, which is A, extremely inefficient, um, because, and it's extremely limited to a particular class. Um, so Emperor Theresian enables a lot of really powerful potential combos, um, off of you know his battle cry ability, obviously it's very situational. You have to have all the particular elements uh, in your hand in order to you know enable them with Emperor Theresian. But you know you can play Emperor Theresian and then you can force warrior your opponent on turn seven. You can you know innervate force double warrior your opponent also on turn seven um, after playing Emperor Theresian. And you know yes you you had to have played Emperor Theresian, but he's you know he's giving you a reasonable body. A five five or six is. Not great. It's a you know you, you are clearly paying up front for the effect that you're getting later, um, but it's also this doesn't reduce them to a minimum of one. This reduces them to potentially zero. We saw this on stream. We saw lightning bolt getting reduced to zero mana. Um, I mean, you can imagine Emperor Thorisian into like you know Malagos blow you up with a million burn spells, and some of these are like you know that actually is kind of cool to me. Like the fact that, that it enables the possibility of of uh, reaching outside of the limits of mana that it normally exists in Hearthstone. Um, I actually think that the, the 10 mana limit is something that uh, causes some design constraints as far as like how cool you can actually make cards in Hearthstone. So like Deathwing is the only 10 mana card in Hearthstone, and you can't really make cards that are you know 11 or 12 mana because there's no way to ever cast them. So there's sort of a, a limit on like how big the biggest badass thing in the game can ever be, um, and you know how big of a you know possible like turn you can have Outside of having mana reduction things like Emperor Thorisian or uh, Prep or whatever. Um, and I think that it's really cool that a card like this can exist. I also think it's really scary. Um, because, like I said, as far as spells are concerned, there are so few ways for your opponent to be able to interact. Um, once you have, like, you know, just cost reduction. Like, like this in, like, a Miracle Rogue style deck. Obviously, uh, you know, you get to the point where, you know, you play Emperor. You have to get to the point where you play Emperor and then you, like, you know, go off by playing the other cards. Um, but, you know, this is the sort of thing that I think that potentially represents design constraints moving forward because, you know, okay, well, how can all these things potentially interact if they're also reduced cost? So, I don't know, it's a really cool card, it's a really scary card, um, and I, I think from a, you know, mostly what I've been talking about is actually not necessarily related to Emperor Thorisian, but more related to the, the lack of the ability to interact with things like what Emperor Thorisian feels like he enables, which is spell-based combos. Um, and you know, I'm I'm definitely interested in seeing the sort of impact that he has on the the metagame and the kind of decks that he enables and uh, that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Um, but I'm also uh, a little a little leery of seeing what all uh, he can make happen. Oh, so if Emperor Thorsian stays in play, it keeps affecting it. Wow. Okay. Um, well, so it's kind of oh, okay. It's kind of like a battle cry in that you're guaranteed to get the effect the turn that you play him. Um, but the fact that you can actually continue to do it every turn is, that's actually, yeah, that actually is kind of powerful too. Um, okay. So that's actually more powerful than I thought it was, at least in a long-term effect, but not necessarily as powerful immediately. Like, you can't play Emperor Thoracy and then just lightning bolt a bunch of things. So, interesting. It doesn't really, that doesn't really significantly change my evaluation of the card, other than that, you know, you can't, like, like now, you can't just, like, play it and then, like, shield slam something, or, you know, on turn six, which is obviously a big difference. Um, but yeah, the fact the fact that it it continues to stack is kind of interesting. Like you could theoretically like you know give it stealth with I guess with Master of Skies or spare parts. I don't think that that giving it stealth with Master of Skies is particularly interesting because like you know a it's a ten mana combo and whatever at ten mana you probably you need to have you know done something to win the game. It's not really something that's really all that meaningful. Um, but uh, it, it, you know it is potentially interesting if you can like you know protect it somehow with like taunts or something like that. Um, but yeah, hmm, interesting. Fire Guard Destroyer. This is an awesome card. Um, I, well, <laughs> this is the sort of card that, that, that A, I think is, um, 
it's very powerful, and it's the sort of card that I feel like Shaman really needs. Um, Shaman, aggressive Shaman decks haven't had great tools. Uh, I was hopeful for Dune Maul Shaman when Goblins vs. Gnomes was released, but the, the four health on Dune Maul Shaman basically doomed him um, to being, you know, no more than a, you know, an arena card or a card that, uh, that you know, you are incredibly mad that your opponent got off of Piloted Sky Golem. Um, Fireguard Destroyer, you know, even at its worst, you know, even at its absolute worst, is a 4-6 for 4. And that's a pretty powerful card. You know, you compare that to, say, Hungry Dragon, which is a 5-6 for 4 with a drawback. This obviously is a drawback as well with Overload. Um, but one of the things that Fireguard Destroyer uh, is is doing for Shaman is it is it is offering a uh, on curve way for uh, Unbound Elemental to potentially be powerful. Um, Unbound Elemental was a card that was pretty powerful in the early days of Hearthstone as far as the Shaman class was concerned, but kind of got outclassed by uh, the other things that you know were introduced in Goblins versus Gnomes and Naxxramas. You know, sort of fell behind the Death Rattle synergies and the Mechs and things like that, um, and in part because there wasn't necessarily great support for it. The only real support were things like Feral Spirits, um, you know, Doom Hammer, and Burn Spells, none of which were particularly good at uh, contesting the sort of boards that people were creating with the sort of mech synergies and things like that. Fireguard Destroyer, though, this is just a really big, efficient minion. You know, four costs for six health to begin with is really powerful. And, you know, I, I am a little bit uh, hesitant to be super excited about any card that has so much inherent randomness in it. Um, in particular, one of, the, one of my concerns about Hearthstone as a competitive game uh, isn't that there's an element of randomness in it. It's a card game. Of course there's randomness in it. Um, but there are lots of cards like Fireguard Destroyer that have explicit randomness in them. Fireguard Destroyer I actually think is a, a kind of, uh, kind of low-grade low randomness because it's just this card is marginally better and it still is as easy to kill. It's not like it's, you know, a like XX, like random uh, possible like health as well. It'll always be just as easy to kill a Fireguard Destroyer no matter what, which is great. Um, the fact that like cards like Piloted Shredder, Piloted Shredder is currently one of my least favorite cards uh, because you know you and your opponent can have a Piloted Shredder, each have a Piloted Shredder, and they fight, and what comes out of them can determine the game quite easily, and that's pretty frustrating. Um, but P Fireguard Destroyer is is a little more palatable kind of randomness because you know yeah maybe it can be incrementally better that your that your you know Fireguard Destroyer is a five six versus a six six. And sometimes you actually don't want it to be a 7-6, so it can't be big game huntered. Um, so there's, there's there's some interesting stuff going on there, but fundamentally I think this is a reasonable kind of random card that's different in terms of you know the way that it impacts your the your sort of experience of the game um, compared to something like Pilot Jedi, for instance. Because when you know you get your opponent gets Millhouse and you get Captain's Parrot, it's just like, well, that was game deciding. Whether Fire Destroyer is you know a 4-6 or a 5-6 isn't necessarily gonna be as big a deal. It can obviously be important. But uh, it's not. It's also not as explicit and in, in your face when you know it goes horribly, horribly wrong. But anyway, this card I definitely think is is, is one that will enable uh, more aggressive shaman decks because that's something that, that hasn't really existed other than the the really aggressive mech shaman decks. Um, like the overload based unbound elemental shaman decks really want something like fireguard destroyer, uh, and I'm really happy that it exists because you know I, I was hoping Dune Mal shaman would be that because I wanted to play unbound elemental because I have these sweet looking gold ones. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to have to wait until Blackrock Mountain and we get this guy. Gang Up. So this is a weird card. Um, Gang Up is a card that basically, it, it has absolutely no impact on the board. Um, that's weird. You know, to be, to be spending mana on something that does nothing to impact the board, ab you know, whatsoever. On the other hand, this is a card that, that if a game goes long, can extremely increase the, the overall quality of your deck or allow you access to a particular sort of effect far more times than you usually get it. Um, my inclination is that this isn't going to be a particularly popular competitive card, uh, but it does offer a pretty interesting effect for something like uh, Fatigue Rogue. <laughs> Being able to uh, triple up on additional copies of Cold Light Oracle is really powerful for a deck that's looking to actually burn out your opponent's deck. Uh, but otherwise, it's, you know, in, in, other than games that go really deep into fatigue or really deep into your deck, and the the relative qu card quality or relative density of particularly particular sorts of effects matters, then this is just not the sort of card that's ever going to matter. You know, when you gang up, if you like, you know, just gang up a piloted shredder, it's like, okay, well now you have a couple more piloted shredders in your deck. That's not really, a, you know, a, a particularly relevant thing. Um, but if you gang up Cold Light Oracle, it's like, okay, well now 
all of a sudden you have like you know gang ups and shadow steps and whatever to try and burn your opponent's deck out. Um, and you know whether that's whether that's enough to make a good deck, probably not. You know you're probably still going to suffer against you know aggressive decks that are able to use the card draw effectively against you. Um, but it is certainly interesting and has uh, some cool combo potential. One thing that's worth noting is that you can actually it looks like you can actually also gang up your opponent's creatures. So if your opponent has a guy uh, that you really want to you know you really want a chance to play with that, it's like okay I'm going to gang up your guy. You know it's the third Ragnaros that gets them. If I've learned anything from playing Priest and thought stealing and mind controlling, it is the third Ragnaros that gets them every time. All right, major demo right here. So this card is hilarious. <laughs> uh, I don't think this card is good, but it is hilarious. Uh, so what the Death Fellow actually does is replace your hero with Ragnaros, which means that you, you have eight max health and you have a hero power of deal eight to a random, uh, a random opponent. Like that is, you know, going to be a dangerous effect to give your opponent the opportunity to trigger with death rattle you know like if you particularly on a nine mana card because you can't do anything else when you play it really and uh, very frequently it will be too soon that your uh, you, that major domo summons Ragnaros because you know demo will get like BGH and then you'll just get attacked and you'll die um, I actually imagine that many games involving major domo may involve major domo dying and then your opponent playing a Ragnaros and ironically killing your you as Ragnaros with Ragnaros the uh, the minion, but but yes, uh, I, I do think that that the the words of Ragnaros in Molten Core, you know, too soon have you awakened me, Executus, uh, is going to be very very key to most of the situations that this guy's involved in. But I do th I, I think that the existence of this kind of card is awesome. Um, I don't think it's going to see play in, in you know in high level competitive decks. It's just it's just not the kind of card that uh, realistically is. Uh, you know, offering enough for its cost and is controllable enough in order to actually give you, uh, you know, the ability to, uh, you know, use it in a way that, that is guaranteed to be effective for you. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one in the, the long line of, of big expensive minions that have cool powers, but I don't even think it's, you know, it isn't even like Big Game Hunter that's, that makes Major Domo a, uh, a, a, you know, a dangerous card to play. Because it's the fact that you know, yeah, your opponent. If if you play a nine cost card that doesn't have an immediate impact on the board, and if your opponent does kill it, it can potentially increase their ability to kill you. Not really what you're looking for. But I do think this card is awesome. I think that it is the design space for Hearthstone that this illustrates is really interesting and really cool. Um, and I'm glad it exists, even though I don't think it'll see play in competitive decks. Resurrect. All right. Summon a random friendly minion that died this game. All right. This is a pretty cool card. Um, it's a card that takes some doing to actually ensure that you're going to get a good effect from it. And frankly, I think it is a dangerous card in the sort of decks that I think priests usually want to play. Um, but, you know, you, if, if you're not playing a deck that's full of cards like Zombie Chow or Shadow Boxer or, you know, all these low cost minions that you're using to fight your opponent's board, and you're playing sort of a more um, combo oriented uh, priest deck, this can be a really powerful effect. You know, two mana for you know a, the the uh, the value of a minion that you you know have, have previously played can be really really good. If you know having having the ability to pay two mana to get something like a Dark Cultist or a Senjin or a Piloted Shredder or uh, a Sludge Belcher, I think is a very powerful effect. Um, it's it's different than than you know some of the cards that we've seen. Uh, you know, priests have like you know Mind Games or uh, what 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 are the other things? I guess it's Mind Vision, which but that's a random card from their hand. But like. Because this is controllable, because you have the ability to, you know, determine, okay, well, I'm only playing these minions in my deck, so at worst, I can get this minion from Resurrect, because it only affects friendly minions, uh, unless your opponent somehow gives you a minion, like with Hungry Dragon or something, Resurrect will, will, will pretty much always give you um, something that is actually relatively high value. That said, I think that the best way, personally, I feel like the best way to play Priest, um, and it, right, both right now and likely moving into... Blackrock Mountain will be a more sort of low to the ground, uh, cheap minion centric type of deck. So uh, I don't think that Resurrect is likely to see tons of play, just because I think that structurally Priest works best with cheap minions that it can use to contest the board uh, and then use its hero power to heal. That's really you know where where Priest is getting the most value out of its hero power is when it has minions to play to heal with them. You know otherwise it's just getting a bad version of armor up from a warrior. So. Uh, you know, I think that cards like Zombie Chow, and we're going to see Twilight Drake in a moment, or Twilight Whelp, 
in a moment. Those are the sort of cards that work really well in Priest decks, um, which makes Resurrect a little bit harder of a sell for me. But if you're playing a you know a somewhat higher curve, bigger Priest deck, I can definitely see Resurrect giving you the sort of tempo swings on particular turns, um, where you can you know you can have a a big play of you know Resurrect plus other thing uh, that allows you to sort of uh, you know turn the corner when you've uh, you've caught up. All right, Revenge. Um, so Revenge. Eh. <laughs> I mean, I don't really play a ton of Warrior, um, but this card doesn't really look like the kind of card that uh, I would want in most of my Warrior decks. Um, in Control Warrior, you're typically you know working to keep your health up um, and you know armor up and things like that, and you know this is basically just a worse Whirlwind. And in the more aggressive versions of Warrior that may want this effect because they want additional uh, additional triggers on self damage things, you'd also rather have Whirlwind, I imagine. It's possible that Revenge and Whirlwind will see play in the same decks um, because you want redundancy on this kind of effect. Like if you're playing, say, a Dragon Egg, uh, you know, Acolyte of Pain, uh, Axe Thrower, Gim Grim Patron deck, like I can certainly imagine wanting two copies of Whirlwind and two copies of Revenge to go along with your Death Bites. Because you know that sort of AOE damage effect is something that's valuable to your fundamental proactive strategy. Um, but other than that, like this seems like you know you on, in most situations would rather just have the mana discount for Whirlwind rather than uh, have the you know a, a additional minor upside of if you uh, if you're able to trigger revenge, do the additional damage. I mean, three isn't exactly a particularly impressive flashpoint either. If this were like five damage it's like okay well now you're now you're really exciting me because that's enough to actually kill a lot of big minions but when i have to be almost dead and uh, you know I'm, I'm killing piloted shredders but nothing bigger I'm, I'm a little less excited you know most of the time one damage is going to be enough to kill a lot of what those things are going to be um I, I i like i said i think that this card has potential in the self damage style of decks in which case it's mostly redundancy for whirlwind um but my my inclination is that unless you know, swarms of two and three health minions suddenly become popular, uh, it's probably not going to see much play over Whirlwind in, uh, in most decks that want it. Solemn Vigil. This is horrible quality. Let me, let me fix this. Remove. Download new version. <laughs> I pulled these all off of Hearthpone. I have to give them credit for uh, getting these screenshots that I'm using. And these snips or whatever. I, I, I have to imagine that they just actually have the direct, uh, the direct files because these are too perfect to actually just be snips from anything. So I'm jealous. All right, let's add this again. All right, Solemn Vigil. So this is a pretty interesting card. Um, one of the things that a lot of aggressive Paladin decks tend to have issues with is card flow. Uh, we see you know, Divine Favor as a possible way to refill your hand in a lot of these decks, but Divine Favor really suffers when you're actually also playing against other aggressive decks because they typically don't have any cards in their hand. Um, so the effect of Solemn Vigil is one that obviously is the same as Arcane Intellect, um, but in, in a class that doesn't necessarily have as easy access to that kind of effect. Um, if, if you, it's kind of like uh, Arcane Intellect if, if you know, you've traded one minion and if multiple minions have died, you have the possibility of getting you know, a, a pretty big discount on this. And I mentioned before that, that this card is particularly exciting to me in combination with um, Chromagus because it does have the ability to possibly be significantly reduced in cost. And if you had, like muster for battle, this is also this compared to cards like Dragon's Breath is in a very different space because Paladin is a class that has both uh, a hero power that generates uh, disposable minions as well as muster for battle, which can allow you to you know be trading off and you know suiciding your minions to get. Uh, the effect of Solemn Vigil or things like Volcanic Drake to have the cost reduction without really paying a, a, a big a big resource cost. Uh, so I, I think that this is a card that actually has a pretty significant amount of potential uh, in sort of a mid range or uh, you know potentially Chromagus Dragon style of of Paladin deck. Right now, the you know the only Paladin card draw you have is again like things like uh, Acolyte of Pain, which is situational based on what your opponent actually has. Uh, lay on hands, which is really expensive, and you know obviously it's a big burst of card drop. But ha being able to reload earlier in the game when you're you know suiciding your uh, your silver hand recruits, 
or you know things like that. You know, I, th I think that a deck with like Volcanic Drake and Solemn Vigil, uh, potentially Chromagus, you know, has a reasonable amount of potential as uh, as something at least worth exploring. You know, it's not to say that this is like a, a world changing card, but I think that it is a, a uh, potentially good, strong utility card for the right deck, uh, and definitely fits. This mechanic definitely fits better in Paladin than in any other class because of Muster for Battle and your hero power. Twilight Well. This guy is adorable, and I think great. Um, so those of you who have paid attention to my sort of historical deck building in uh, Hearthstone may have uh, may have seen that I have built you know dragon priest decks before it was cool. <laughs> uh, you know I was I was playing board control uh, into Ysera style decks uh, even back when you know the Unleash Hunter decks were popular, and Twilight Whelp is kind of like a uh, a zombie chow without the drawback. Um, and some people might say that, oh, well, in Priest, you know, Zombie Chow doesn't necessarily have a drawback because you have Akanai Soul Priest. And, you know, a lot of uh, Priest decks I actually think don't want to play with Akanai Soul Priest because they are more sort of healing and board focused than want to have the, you know, the, the sort of burst damage or anything like that. Um, and some decks may actually want four copies of a 2 3 for 1. You know, you can have a, uh, a deck that has both Twilight Whelp and Zombie Chow in it if you really want to be able to contest the board early. Uh, and you know, with with Twilight Whelp, yes, if you if you miss the the uh, the trigger, if you're not holding a dragon, it's actually a pretty high cost. Um, you know, being a two one versus a two three is a huge huge difference. And what, that's one of the big things about Twilight Whelp. Compare it to say Zombie Chow. Compare it to Zombie Chow. Like, how much of a difference is the the not having the the downside on Zombie Chow? Uh, you know, that your opponent regains the life. And unless you're playing a very aggressive deck. I think that in many cases, being guaranteed the the trigger for uh, the gu guaranteed the extra two health on your zombie chow is likely to be worth it, rather than playing Twilight Whelp, um, simply because especially if you're if you're uh, the first player, if you're player one and you only have a three card hand, let's say your hand is Twilight Whelp and two expensive dragons, it's like do you do you keep that hand? Do you, do you mulligan one of the dragons and keep the other one? You know, like you really generally want to mulligan to, into a hand that has a, a an effective curve, uh, and Twilight Whelp is you know going to make it pretty difficult to uh, ensure that you can both have the Twilight Whelp on time, and that you're able to actually have your you know your curve after that if you're holding an expensive dragon in order to to ensure that you're able to enable it. Uh, this is a sort of card that makes it a lot better to have the coin um, because you have an additional card in your opening hand. Uh, which is an additional card that's able to potentially be a dragon to enable the the Twilight Whelp battle cry in the first turn. So this is a card that I was initially pretty excited about because I was like, oh wow, you can play you know a, a two three on turn one uh, and not have to worry about the the Zombie Chow drawback. But the more I thought about it, the more that this card seemed like it was it's pretty troubled compared to Zombie Chow because you're you know I, I think I would much rather have the guaranteed two health on on turn one um, rather than the you know. Uh, the elimination of the Zombie Chow drawback, particularly in a deck that is not all that likely to care about the additional health all that much because you're playing the long game. So um, I, this is a card that I, I'm, I very much I'm, uh, have a question mark about because it seems like it's potentially quite powerful. Um, it, you know, if you do want eight of the or four of this effect, I say eight because in Magic you you know you have four four of a card. But anytime I think about having you know oh you can have redundancy in this, you can have eight of them. It's like no, I actually mean four when I'm talking about Hearthstone. Um, so. Yeah, the the if you're holding a dragon effects get uh, a little bit a little bit dicey, particularly on the early game ones, um, and especially when you're you are the, the primary player when you don't have the the four cards with the coin. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is a card that has potential, but is going to be going to need to uh, play around with a bit in order to see if it's worth justifying over Zombie Chow. Yeah, we have one more card, and it's a card that makes me so sad. This is a card that seems like it's going to be pretty cool. You know, it's a 7-8 taunt that can be, you know, massively discounted. It, Druid isn't a class that, that this mechanic is particularly impressive in. Um, you know, we saw this with Volcanic Drake. We saw this um, with, uh, what is it, Solemn, Solemn Vigil and Dragon's Breath. Um, I think that, as I said during the review of Solemn Vigil, I think that uh, that's the, you know, the, the place where it's probably the strongest because Paladin's a class that can easily throw away minions and generate additional minions to get that cost reduction trigger. But in Constructed, Volcanic Lumberer would be so much better if it were just a 6-8 because of Big Game Hunter. And, you know, I, I, I feel like this is something I say all the time, but I feel like the, you know, this is a card that could be cool if Big Game Hunter didn't exist. And there's lots of those. 
Um, and you know, I I I don't I feel like I I uh, you know. There's probably a lot of people who are like, oh, well, Big Game Hunter is really important for, you know, this, this, and this. And I agree that the current metagame and the development of the cards uh, are all balanced around the fact that Big Game Hunter does exist. But it makes me sad that there are so many cards like this that are unlikely to ever really see play um, because Big Game Hunter exists and they're not worth trying to enable. Building your deck in such a way that you can, you know, trade off, like, early guys to get a discount, you know, uh, Volcanic Lumber, or like set up Poison Seeds into a Volcanic Lumber, or whatever else, it's just not worth it, because your opponent can just kill it with Big Game Hunter. Alright, well anyway, sorry Volcanic Lumber, Big Game Hunter, you're in his sights. Okay, quick shot. So, two cost, Hunter Spell, deal three damage if your hand is empty, draw a card. This card is clearly pretty strong. Um, I've seen some people commenting that they think this card is too good, and that this card, uh, you know, leads to Hunter being too powerful, or something like that. But realistically, um, I, I don't know where I don't know exactly where this card's role is. I think it's definitely the card that can be potentially pretty strong in face hunter decks. But if you look at the way that face hunter decks actually play, they're rarely actually empty-handed. Um, yes, like three damage for, for for two mana is like you know totally fine. It's it's particularly strong in hunter because you care about just damaging the face. But if you look at face hunter decks, they frequently include cards like um, like Arcane Golem or uh, Iron Beak Owl or Leroy. And all these sort of things that you can't just easily empty your hand and, you know, there be no implications to that. Um, so most of the time I think we're looking at Quickshot as just two, two mana deal three damage. And is that a card that Face Hunter wants? Maybe. And certainly in, in some situations you'll be able to, you know, Quickshot into another spell late in the game when your hand is empty. But in my experience, and I've actually been playing a lot of Face Hunter, um, because I, think, I actually think the deck's quite strong. And as to whether it's okay that a deck like uh, uh, Face Hunter is strong, you know, if it's good for the game, etc. That's another question entirely in my mind. Um, but I don't think that this is actually a card that seems like it's outrageously powerful in Face Hunter because there's already a lot of cards that have similar kinds of effects. Um, I definitely think that it's likely to see play in Face Hunter. You, you might play it over something like Wolf Rider because it can bypass taunts, you know, it's direct damage. But at the same time, you know, the fact that your opponent has to then deal with those minions, those charge minions, uh, is a pretty big deal. So I do think this card is definitely strong. I think it'll very likely see play in Face Hunter, um, you know, potentially as a replacement for some of those charge minions or something like that in the late game, um, just because it is you know, damage that can go through taunts guaranteed. Um, but I don't think this is the sort of card that's going to be outrageously powerful because your hand is rarely empty as a Face Hunter because you do have those situational cards you're holding on to um, in order to actually uh, actually be able to break through your opponent's taunts and win the game. So uh, I think this is a strong card. I don't think this is a game-breaking card, and I don't think it's going to, you know, sort of massively upset the balance of the world such that Face Hunter is the best deck ever, uh, as some people seem to think. So, yep, there we go. So yeah, I think that is all the cards that were revealed today. So overall, you know, I think that there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff in Blackrock Mountain. I'm, I'm definitely excited to see uh, how things play out. I'm also pretty excited to see just how the sort of metagame develops from week to week. Um, one of the cool things that that's going to happen with the adventure, as opposed to a normal set, is the fact that there's individual cards that are just released. Um, well, not individual cards, individual groups of cards, small groups of cards that are released uh, week by week as the different wings unlock. Um, unfortunately, I'm actually not going to be able to experience that the first couple of weeks. I actually leave on Wednesday um, for a, uh, a Magic tournament in uh, in Belgium, and I won't be back for like a week and a half. Um, so I'm going to have to be, you know, watching from the sidelines as people uh, are able to sort of explore using the first couple of uh, of weeks worth of 